Uh, well, welcome to another presentation on Spaycaster. You're going to see quite a few of them today. And uh, as the introduction said, my name is Simon Gorza. I work for Rio Products. And uh, I'm doing a little thing on trout spay. And the word spay is a river in Scotland. And when you fish the river in Scotland, you observe a certain number of traditions. And the most important tradition with anything to do with spay is a hip flask. <laughs> and what you have to do is you have to bless the people you fish with, the fish, the river, the fishing gods, and in this case, the casting gods, and to you lot. So we dram. Salute. Hey, don't drink it all. <laughs> I'll save a wee bit for you later. So respect traditions, I think, is a really important thing. Uh, so Trout Spay. As I said, this demonstration is on Trout Spay, and it's kind of a strange name, because Trout Spay gives people the idea that you're fishing for trout, and this is an only a, a trout technique. Well, it's not only, and only is kind of the, the word there that I would like to remove from your mind, because let's start with what this is. Uh, as you can see, I've got a bunch of outfits there, and I'm just going to run through a few things on, tra on Trout Spay. If you have questions, obviously ask, put your hand up. People nod, you know, I can see lots of people nodding. Do you have a question? Oh, your hand went right up. I'm watching for those hands. A lot of people nod. So yeah, I'll answer questions, and nobody ever asks them. So if you have them, fire them out there, OK? This is a, a four weight, right? So this is a two-handed rod. And let's run through a little name terminology, if you like. Yonks. Long ago, there was salmon rods, two-handed salmon rods. And that's what they used to be called in the UK when they were fished. There were salmon rods, or two-handed rods, or double-handed rods. That was the terminology. When they came over to the Americas, they got turned into spay rods, the name. Gradually, things evolved. Rods got shorter. People started to realize that the fish are not as big as the, the American, uh, sorry, the, the British fish and the Norwegian fish and the Russian fish. And rods got smaller and rivers are a bit smaller and rods got smaller still. And out came this thing called a switch rod. Switch rod came out in the early 2000s. And really, a switch rod is a type of two handed rod that is less than 12 feet in length. Generally speaking, anything over 12 feet is a two handed rod or a spay rod. And anything under 12 feet is a switch rod. That's kind of the modern terminology. And then evolution, maybe two or three years ago, people started fishing these things for trout. And the rods got lighter and lighter in size. This is a four weight. I have a three weight there. There's two weight ones. So these are much lighter size rods. And they are now called trout spays. So it's kind of a terminology thing. Just for those who don't know what it is, a trout spay is basically a switch rod i.e. under 12 foot, but for a two weight, three weight, maybe a four weight fly line. That's a trout spay. Some people call them micro spays, some people call them trout spays, but kind of just to give you the terminology of what we're talking about, what this demonstration is on, it's on little lightweight two-handed outfits, which is a lot of fun. And there's a couple of real kind of rules of thumb, a little top tips here which I would recommend. And the first one is you double the number of the rod for the size of the fish you're catching. That's a really good rule of thumb. If you're coming into this from a one-handed world and you're a trout angler, the commonest trout line in the, in the one-handed world is a five weight, right? certainly in the US. A nine foot five weight is like the staple. So most people, when they go trout fishing for the first time and they get into this trout spay, say, oh, I want a five weight one of these because I fish a five weight one-hander. And that is a mistake. So the first thing, as I said, is you double the rod size to the fish size. This is a four weight. So this is perfect for anything up to about eight pounds. That's why I say, forget the word trout spay. This is my Deschutes rod. I fished this on yesterday uh, up on the Rogue, trying to catch a steelhead. I didn't, but I was trying to. You know, the fish are five, six, seven pounds. You don't need a really monster two-handed rod for that. You want to make sure the rod is light enough to have a little bit of fun with, and that also satisfies the fishery. So a four weight's good for fish up to about eight pounds. A three weight that I've got there, that's good for fish up to about six pounds. And that's kind of why they call them trout spays, because, you know, trout aren't really bigger than six pounds, or you're fishing in New Zealand or a liar if you're catching a lot of fish that are over six pounds that are trout. So this four weight is the same as the other rule of thumb, is you, it gets complicated, right? You, you didn't realize this was a course in maths, but it is. Uh, the other rule of thumb is you add three to the rod size to convert it to a one hand. So explaining that in simple terms, this is a four weight trout spay switch rod, four plus three is seven. This is the same as me using a seven weight one-handed rod. 
Okay, and I'll show you that in a second. What I've got here rigged up, I've got a three-weight trout spay, and I've got a six-weight one-handed rod. And what you'll see is I'll just change the two lines over, and you'll see that they match up perfectly. So again, it's just a way of putting this into, into a kind of a comprehension to understand what are you getting into when you get into the game of trout spay. Trout spay is fun. First of all, these things are really, really light. You can see there's very little effort used to cast these things. If you're fishing a one-handed rod, you tend to use a lot longer strokes. Even if you use a spay cast, you tend to use a lot uh, longer casting strokes. If you, a couple of things to realize. First of all, you've got to make sure the rod's balanced, right? It's really important that you're going to find your top hand is really a fulcrum point when you're casting. So you see how easy it is for me to move the rod at the bottom, and that's because this is where this rod balances. So I've chosen a reel heavy enough to balance the rod where I like to hold it. Now, if you've got long arms, and you like to hold the rod up here, you're going to use a lighter reel, because you can see this reel's too heavy. And if you've got little short arms and you want to hold it down here, well, you can see, you need a heavier reel to make it balance. So balance is a really important part of this thing, because you want this thing to be easy. It's an effortless way of casting. That's why you pick one of these up. The kind of main reason is that you've got trees behind you, right? People get into spade casting because there's trees behind them. That's the first thing. That's why people generally start. And then people get into it because it's fun. It's a really fun style of casting. And it doesn't matter if you're fishing for steelhead or bass or salmon. I know people who fish these things for tarpon, believe it or not, in the, in the keys when they're fishing channels that are flowing. They do a little spay cast and chuck it out. I don't know how you land a tarpon on one of these. I'm not dumb enough to try. But it doesn't matter. And I don't want you to get stuck in the name trout spay because it's for trout. Right? It is just for fish up to about eight pounds, this one. So that's kind of an introduction to what these are, what trout spays are. What I've got on the end here, there's a couple of types of lines, and, and if you're into the spade game, you'll probably be familiar with the, the title and the name of these things. This is a Scandi type line. And a Scandi type line is a line that is pretty well all front taper. If you don't know what you've got, just take your line and kind of measure about six feet and fold it back on itself and kind of compare the diameter. And you can see this is thinner than that. And I come back another six feet or four feet in this case, and this is still th this is thicker. And I come back and it still gets thicker. So this thing gets thicker and thicker towards the back. That's what a Scandi type line is. The green line I have on that rod is what's called a Skagit type line. Completely different shape, has a completely different purpose in life. Scandi type lines are good for a couple of things. First of all, presentation. You can see when they unroll, these Scandi type lines are really soft gentle presentation, great with small flies. One of the things I like about Scandi type lines is that when you make any kind of spay cast is that the line unrolls very, very efficiently. Right? Because when your line hits the, energy is a funny old thing, when you're casting a loop and a loop is unrolling, as your line gets lighter and lighter, it can continue its path. Right? Because you're not increasing its energy, it can continue its path. So with, with Scandi lines like this, you get these lovely little presentations, you get some nice efficient cast, you get a lot of distance, this doesn't require a lot of effort, and you tend to get nice little loops as a result of it. So Scandi type lines are, whether you're in the trout world, the steelhead world, the salmon type world, Scandi type lines are designed really for fishing smaller flies, presentation, a little bit of fun. And I'll come on the opposite in a second. This one is an integrated line. And you can see there's an orange section here. And in the world of spay, a lot of casters use shooting heads. They flip from Skagit heads to Scandi heads, right? If you know that, you're probably nodding away and know what I'm talking about. The trout angler doesn't like a lot of heads. It doesn't like a lot of looped loop connections going up and down the rod ring. Because a lot of times you're fishing, you might fish soft tackles, which is my all-time favorite way of fishing for trout. I love swinging a little three-weight trout spay with a couple of soft tackles on an intermediate tip and just working them and feathering them and moving them and swinging them around like that. And gradually you're stripping your line in like this. And if you've got a loop-to-loop -loop connection where that orange line is, you're going to find you're stripping it in and the loops are in the rod rings and you've got to kind of flick them out and get the, the loops out and then you make a cast and you know there's a bit of a, a fuss because you have loops so generally speaking if you're a trout angler trout angler is like more kind of one piece lines with a running line and everything attached and that's what this is this is an integrated line we make it real called the scandi trout spay uh, or the in-touch trout spay and it's just a one piece so if you're going to go for smaller flies as i said start to lean towards that scandi style of line Well, that is a brilliant question. See, somebody asked a question. Thank you. So the orange is, is, a, is where you strip. So 
and the reason I say it's a brilliant question because you can make a real mistake. If I have the orange at the tip of the rod and I make a spay cast, you can see it unrolls easy. If I make this little spay cast, it unrolls easy. And I shoot a bit of line. The gray behind this orange is thin running line. So if you would try and make a spay cast with any of that gray out, you'll find that the cast fails. Right? The, the, the thin line is too thin to make the cast work. So the point of the orange is you, however far you cast, you strip in into that orange at the tip of the rod. And then if you want to get distance, then you shoot it out. But you don't try and cast with that gray stuff outside the rod. You always strip it in. So it's just a visual indicator of where that line is going to load up best. I do miss your white rod, though. <laughs> I still have it. Uh, I still have it, yeah, <laughs> in my cupboard. It's a great teaching rod, that's for sure, a white rod. So with that line, uh, and again, I didn't mean this to be a math lesson, but one of the most fascinating things to me, I, I'm an anal fly line geek that I am, is that a fly line has this power, and the power is measured in grains per foot. Okay, so. Let's give you a very, very simple idea. Imagine you had a line that is 60 feet long and it weighs 600 grains. Right? Its average weight is 10 grains every foot. I know there's tapers and things like that, but this is just an illustration of the relevance of line power. So 600 grains over 60 feet, average weight 10 grains a foot. Now, what if you had a 600 grain line that is 10 foot long? The weight's the same, but the weight per foot is now way more because of course you've got that over a shorter piece. So when you talk about fly line's power and ability to do things, don't worry so much about the grain weight that loads the rod. That's a ballpark for what you like as a caster, for what the rod likes as the correct load to load it up. What you want to work out is how much power does that have for what you want to do. For example, on the end of here, you can see I've got a fly with a lot of weight. You can see how it plops in the water. I've got a, uh, one of Doug's aqua flies here, intruder type fly. And on the end of this, I've got a level sinking tip here, seven and a half foot of T8, so it's a fast sinking tip. Let's say I'm winter fishing for, or, or fall fishing for brown trout up on the Missouri, and I, I need to fish a heavy streamer. If you put that type of outfit on the front end of a Scandi that goes down in tapers, the front end of a Scandi like that, the front foot, because it tapers all the way down to the thinnest point, that front foot weighs about four grains for one foot, it's got nothing there. There's no guts to turn over a lot of mass. And so when you want to cast a big fly or a heavy sink tip, or not even a big fly, let's say a big air resistant bass popper or something that's just tricky to cast, you've got to have mass. I have this little analogy that, that seems to work. Um, I had to change it slightly when I moved from England to America. And this analogy is that imagine you stood a brick up on its end, right? And, and you stood 10 feet away from it and your buddy gave you a ping pong ball table tennis ball and said, right, when you knock that brick over and you throw it with all your might and the brick stands up and the ping pong wall bounces back and hits you in the face because it shows you you're an idiot trying to do that. Then your mate gives you a, a cricket ball, my analogy changed out, a baseball. And you try and do the same thing. Well, you get your 10 bucks real easy because that baseball knocks the, the brick over. So what that illustrates is that mass moves mass. So when you want to cast flies that are heavy or air resistant and sink tips that are fast sinking and stuff like that, you need a line with a lot more mass at the front. And that is a style of line called a Skagit type line. And you can see on here, so I've got this heavy fly on. I'm not, this, this demonstration isn't really on casting techniques. In fact, not at all. There's plenty of great casting, like Jeff's last one on casting there. Some fantastic tips. So I'm not going to talk about the techniques and stuff like that. If anyone has questions or want to see anything after my presentation or after the demonstrations are done, I'm very happy to take you around the corner and show you some stuff. But this isn't a presentation on that. This is on gear. So with this one, as you can see here, I've got a sink tip on and a heavy fly. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to move a heavy fly and a heavy sink tip. And I've gone down to a three weight rod here. So this is an even lighter rod than that four weight. But there's zero issue of this style of line, the Skagit type of line, moving streamers, sink tips, bass bugs, and things like that. Right? I've just chosen the right tool for the job. And then think of these as tools. If I've got a, a bit of wood and I need to hammer a nail in, I'm not going to choose a screwdriver. Right? I'm going to choose a hammer. And so that's what this is. This is my hammer because I'm casting big flies. So even in the trout world now, 
we've come up with a series of lines that are designed for the trout world that go down in Skagit styles and in Scandi styles. And this one is a shooting head. And what that means is, for those who don't know, what a shooting head means basically is there's this loop-to-loop -loop connection here and you can kind of separate it. You can pull a head off. You know, one day you might be fishing a heavy fly and you're working down a run like this and you go, oh, this is a perfect soft tackle run and I want to fish my Scandi. Well, with this system, you just loop your head off loop on the Scandi head that's in your pocket, and now you're fishing. Right? You only have one reel, one shooting line. So we, we have both options. You have the head individual, and we also have the head with the integrated running line in case that's the style you want. And again, all these are set up up on the Sage and Rio stand. If anyone wants to try any of this stuff, it's right there. Give it a shot. What I've got on here, another new product we've come out with here, this is one of the, the closet things that I think is a really cool. I'm a teacher. I like teaching fly casting. And so I might exaggerate a little bit if your casting is decent and call it good and you know pump you up a little bit. What I've got here is a shooting line that is called a metered shooting line. It changes color every 10 feet. So you know how far you actually cast. Therein lies the problem. You're out on the river, you make your, your best cast of the day, and you go, oh, there's about a 75-foot cast. And you count the colors, and there's a bit of orange, there's 10 foot, there's a bit of gray and orange there. That, that front end, that front orange is a taper, so it's only three foot long. The next gray is a seven foot, so that front two colors is 10 feet. The next orange is 10 feet, the next gray is 10 feet, the next orange is 10 feet. So the problem with this is you think you're casting a long way because you're all just used to throwing 80-foot casts, aren't you? And in reality, when you add it up, you say, right, I've got a 23-foot head on and I've got a uh, 20 feet of running line. Let me just get a bit more out. There's 30 feet of running line. But where I think this is really a cool thing, as a, first as a teacher, because it, as I teach people, it tells me if they're improving. Oh, you're casting 30 feet of running line now. 35 feet of running line. That's pretty cool aid as a teacher and if you're a learner it's a pretty cool aid because it gives you the actual knowledge of how far you really are casting but where this comes into play as an angler is if you're working your way down the pool and let's say every cast you make you're a consistent caster you're consistently throwing out your lines and you're fishing the same length of line all the time and you've got that out and you work your way down the pool and let's say I've got the orange right at the tip of my rod here so I know I've got 30 feet of running line right I've got a gray an orange and then the double color and somehow I hook a fish Oh, brilliant, I've got a fish, I play it on the reel, I land it, I get in here, I've got all the celebrations, I get my whiskey out, because I do celebrate, and then get back in again. Well, you can go straight back to that same spot, because you just pull out three color changes again, you see, so you know you're consistently working your way down the pool, not trying to guess. So that's a little cool thing that's kind of an addition on there, as I say, it's called a metered shooting line, which we've just come up with, for all sizes. And then the last thing on this um, spade thing I wanted to show you, any questions, by the way? Okay, the last thing I wanted to show you on this, and this is why I will add a little bit of instruction on here because it's pretty hard to do these demonstrations and not teach something because uh, everybody likes to learn. And that is combining these two weapons. Thank you, good sir. Which is the three weight, that one. And let's take this one for a minute. So, this is a say, this is a three weight. This is a, a sage thirty one ten. So it's a eleven foot three weight. This has now become my absolute all time favorite two handed rod. You know, I do quite a bit of trout fishing, obviously. I do a bit of steelhead fishing. Don't catch so many steelhead. But when you're trout fishing, you know, double this rod size. Remember that tip at the very beginning. Double this rod size. When you're trout fishing, you're not going to catch many trout over six pounds. There's not many rivers that got trout that kind of size. So this is a, an absolute perfect two-handed rod if you're a trout caster. If you get into trout and you really enjoy the two-handed game and the spade casting game, I don't think there's a lot better weight of outfit than a three weight. Uh, it doesn't matter what make it is. There's lots of great trout spades out there that all the manufacturers make now that are, go down to three weights. It's just that three weight, just don't get stuck on buying a five weight trout spay and going out and catching an 18 inch trout and thinking it's fun. It's overkill. It's like you're taking an eight weight one handed rod and trying to catch that same trout. Nobody would do that in their own right. right? So just correlate this rod with a two handed rod. And this, as I said, this is like a six weight. 
So here I have on this little Scandi, this trout Scandi head on there. You can see it just pops it out. I've got a couple of soft tackles on. I work my way down. But if you're not a two-handed caster, and this is why I wanted to show you this. This is my little 10-foot six-way X. If you're not a two-handed caster, you can see that these whole things are designed. They're short enough and they're designed to go on a one-handed rod. And the point about the one-handed rod is all your spade techniques, whether it's a one-handed rod or a two-handed rod, the techniques of spade casting are going to be the same. Right? You've got these things called D-loop. Jeff was just talking about D-loop. You've got these things, your anchor, your train tracks. You've got all these parts of a cast that make a cast work. Uh, and that doesn't matter whether it's two-handed or one-handed. A couple of things change. Obviously, one of the things that changes is that your bottom hand is no longer on the rod, right? Because you've got your one-handed rod rather than a two-handed rod. But having said that, as you get to be a good spay caster and you have a good tempo and a good technique, then your bottom hand, your spare hand, if you like, in the single-handed world, comes into play. And I'll show you that in a second. Let's just hand this one back, would you mind? Keep laying you down with sticks. So I said, there's the three weight. This is a six weight. And you can see that it handles a six weight. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect load on that. So that, as I said, that's the other. The only reason I rigged this out was to give you the idea that if you don't use those two handers and you want to do this spade game with a one hander rod, this is, the, this is the, the right kind of gear, you can just make all your one handed spade casts. Um, but with the same gear. You don't need to buy a separate outfit just to, to take it off your two-handed trout spay rod. So the lesson I was going to talk about, when you've got your spay techniques dialed in, right? you've got what a D-loop is, and you've got your train track set up, and you've got all the, the things that make a good spay cast, there's a forward stroke. Right? And every forward cast is a forward stroke. And I'm going to, going to just turn this way and show you so you can kind of see it with my shoulder. And I just want to go in slow motion, a good forward stroke. Right? You should have a slight wedge here. That open area there, if you like, if you call that as a wedge. And this is really good. I know there's a lot of people who teach sticking up your sleeve. And that kind of, that's a cheating way of giving you some control on the wrist. But you should use a wrist when you're making a single-handed cast. There's a wrist rotation. Right? The fastest way to move the rod is to close the wrist. I can move that rod 10 feet. See the tip of that rod 10 feet in a very, very quick second. So it's a very, very, it's the fastest part of your casting stroke. So you should always use a wrist. Whether you're overhead casting like this or spay casting, you still are going to utilize a little opening of the wrist and closing the wrist. So in the casting terminology, if you like, this shape here is the wedge. And I'm going to do this in slow motion first because I want to show you a really good forward stroke. A really good forward stroke is where this black button drives forward and the wedge is maintained. So here's a good one. I'll, and I'll turn around in a second so you can see me. This is a good move. I get to here, and then I close the wedge. All right, so the wedge should close the last part of the cast. A bad move, very, very common, is the wedge starts to close as people come forward. Can you see the difference from there? Am I too far away? Kind of see that? Let me show you down here so you can kind of see that. So this is a good move. You drive, and there's a wedge angle here. I drive, I drive, I retain that angle. I get to here. This arm will stop, and I just close the wrist. That's a good casting stroke. Bad casting stroke is this rod. If you look at this black butt, if it starts heading to my arm as I go forward, that's a bad stroke. Right? And what's happening, the simple way of looking at it is load. Right? When, when the best way to cast a rod is to get the rod flexed. Then the rod's doing all the work. The rod is flexed like that, it's doing all the work, that's great, you don't do the work. And what makes a rod flex is you're loading it against this D-loop. So when you drive forward, the longer you can keep the rod behind you, the more it's going to load back against that D-loop. The moment you start rotating the rod as you come forward, you can kind of see the D-loop pushing in front of you. So have a look, watch people casting today, watch yourself casting, and you'll find whether it's a two-handed rod or a one-handed rod, that a lot of people, when they come forward, they're gonna do this, roll the rod over, and they pivot over it. And what you look for when you're trying to identify that on your own cast or somebody else's cast is you look at the shape of the loop. Is it parallel with more of a kind of a wedgy point to it? Or is it fairly wide and rounded like a balloon that you can drive a bus through the middle? Because if it is, 
you have probably pivoted. I'm going to do it on a roll cast so you can kind of just see. Here's a roll cast with me closing the wedge. See how round that loop is? There's a lot of width to it. But it's, I'm doing the worst possible thing. I'm keeping my arm still and doing only wrist. But again, if you do that, if I come forward and pivot, I'll get the same bad loop shape. It's big. And that's because I'm pivoting. Now watch what happens if I hold that wedge shape and then close at the end. You see how much tighter that loop is? It unrolls in the air. It's narrow. See wedge held? Close the wedge. So as part of your casting stroke development, one-hand or two-handed, you are trying to maintain this angle, not lose the angle as you drive forward. And that is so common watching people cast, one hand or two hand. Four minutes, Leslie's on in a sec, so I better wind this up. So the tip that I'm giving you is that when you get into spade casting, or in fact, when you get into any casting, you do these things called double haul, right? A double haul is this left hand is soaring of the line, haul it here and haul it there. And, uh, and if you're a good overhead caster, you, you, you'll double haul. If you're, if you're a saltwater angler, you learn this double haul. In spay casting, you, you, you can put hauls into it, and a haul in a spay cast is called a turbo. Right? So this is a cast called a turbo switch. See how I put the haul into that forward? That's a turbo switch. Here's a turbo snake roll. All right, so I've, I've put a haul into it. So the point of me showing you that is, first of all, if you don't do that, you should. You should add a haul to any of your forward strokes. But the reason I'm mentioning it in correlation to that wedge is that the wedge, the closure of the wedge, is the exact time you put your haul in. Not before. Let me show you what I mean in slow motion. Very common, when I'm teaching people this cast the first time, they're in this position here, and this left hand starts to haul right now. Well, I'm halfway through the haul, and I've still got my wedge. I shouldn't have even started that haul. Right, that, the correct time of doing it is this. Now, I'm going to haul and pull the wedge, close the wedge. That is how late your haul should be if you're doing like these turbo space. Right, so, let me just show you with a couple of roll casts. Here's an early haul. You can see there's not a lot of speed. I'm taking, I don't combine two speeds. The haul is an acceleration of the line, and the snap of the wrist is an acceleration of the rod. So you want those two accelerations at the same time. Otherwise, you don't benefit. You don't want two accelerations independent of each other. You want them at the same time for maximum speed. And so the crux of that is that when you're practicing these, these turbo casts, really try and delay that haul till you close the wrist, till you close that wedge. See how late that haul is? Look, my hands are together until about here. Once my hand gets here, then my haul starts. And again, if you're trying it, the first few times, you'll probably start hauling there. Because it's, you do, people do. I, I shout at them, and they still do it. I hit them with a stick, I still do it. But the point anyway is, if you're doing the turbo spades, or if you're, if you're taking the one-handed rods, yes, you can absolutely get a whole bunch of these trout spades. But do remember, if you're going this route, that number three difference. Six weight rod, three weight trout spay line. Otherwise, if you get a six weight trout spay line on here, you will crush it. It's like a nine weight. And get on there. If you're, if you're a single handed angler, and again, this rod's going to be up there, and if anyone wants to borrow it and have a little shot at this, then come, by all means, give it a go. Come, come, try some of these turbo casts. Little turbo switch casts is the best way to learn. I just do these switches that Jeff was just talking about. Late haul, then try an early haul. Just much less line speed than try a late haul, then try a snake roll for the turbo. So you can do those spade casts, but utilize that left hand if you're using a one-hand rod. You get a lot more line speed, and you get the cast a lot more efficient and effortless.